Hi, welcome to day three of uh, our little uh, adventure here. We're uh, a fair. My name is Cindy. I'm with Fair Care, and we're going through the Love Kindlers this week. Um, just in case you've missed maybe the first couple of days, uh, uh, I'm doing this so that you uh, to introduce to you our little program. It's uh, 90 days to save your marriage and save you, and um, so to take it off in the spirit of uh, kind of introducing things. Uh, we're starting with our basic concepts and then uh, the first basic concepts we're going through are the love kindlers. So um, I can just recap really quickly. Um, here at Affair Care we believe that love is a decision and not a feeling. Uh, it's a conscious choice to act in a loving way towards someone and it's an initiated action. In other words you don't just think about it, you don't just sit there and feel all smooshy. You actually do something about it. Um, so um, to help understand what a love kindler is, and uh, we have the, the two terms there, love kindlers and love extinguishers. So uh, we uh, envision that love in a marriage is like a campfire. And around the campfire, there's the little stones. Those are the, uh, they protect the fire and kind of you know keep it in one spot and whatnot. That's the vows that protect the love in the marriage. And then there are actions that a person can take that will uh, put out the fire. We call those love extinguishers. And it can be something small from a little cup uh, that, you know, maybe damns it, but it doesn't really put it out. All the way up to uh, a gigantic um, pail or bucket that pretty much puts the fire out instantly. That's what an affair is. And they will put the fire out pretty quickly. <laughs> and um, a love kindler, on the other hand, is an action that would build the love, that would um, make the fire hotter, that would make it warmer, brighter. Your 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 love is growing. So this is an action that would um, be loving and kind and gentle and and everything to your spouse. So um, when you first meet somebody, uh, the way that you fall in love is that there basically are no love extinguishers because you know you, you don't live together or anything and you put your best foot forward you look good you take the time to dress up you uh, go and do fun things together you can't wait to spend time together so you spend a lot of time you know you actually listen to each other you're investing a lot of kindlers and not many there's there's no extinguishers because you're putting your best foot forward so what happens is Kindler, 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 guess what? The fire grows and pretty soon it gets to a point where the fire's grown and you get married. So that's how love is built. Um, then once you get married, um, the first year, you know, you've heard how people say the first year is tough. Well, that's because the first year um, you get the first extinguishers introduced. You might, uh, you know, the little things I've, I've mentioned before, yes, like yesterday, <laughs> uh, uh, the toilet paper is upside down, right? Sque squeezing the tube of toothpaste in the middle. He loads the dishwasher wrong. You know, it's crazy little stuff like that, but it's like little dampers. So um, that first year can be tough. And then the kids come, the bills get bigger, um, they're spending less time together. Um, you and your spouse maybe argue about the bills, and that's more extinguishers. So then even if you do add a Kindler, you add an extinguisher and it it's not growing anymore. And that's how people fall out of love, so to speak, is that there are enough extinguishers going on that it puts out the love. So what we're talking about now is um, this week, we're talking about the love Kindler so that we can go through each one, there are seven, and explain in a little bit more depth what they are and I'll give you some examples of, of, way, of things that you can do that are kindlers in your marriage. Um, so uh, the first day we talked about kindler number one, that's emotional commitment, meeting your spouse's need to be loved, valued, respected, and trusted, appreciated, admired, you know, emotional stuff. Uh, yesterday we talked about a spiritual commitment. This would be a meeting your spouse's need to grow spiritually. Um, so you, you make an environment in your marriage where your spouse can grow spiritually and you commit to their spiritual welfare. And today, uh, kind of been looking forward to this one, we're going to be discussing uh, Love Kindler number three, 
which is physical commitment. Okay, love kindler number three, it, physical commitment. This is meeting your spouse's needs uh, as they relate to the physical uh, part of marriage. Now, in my personal opinion, there are a couple of areas that relate to physical. That would be uh, the need to be uh, affectionately touched in a non-sexual way, the need to have a mutually fulfilling sex life, and the need to be physically attracted to your spouse. Okay, and we'll be touching on each one of those and uh, giving some, some, again, sticking with our synthetic counseling, we will be giving some um, biblical reference for you. So, um, let's start with the need for non-sexual touch. Um, first, I have to make a comment. You know, here, not all of the people who listen to the blog are coming from the United States, but a big majority do. And here in the U.S., we have a fixation on physical, the exterior. Um, you have to be a certain weight. You have to be, you know, this or that to be beautiful. And um, you have to be young. And sex is all about me, 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 and give me my orgasm, and my comment to all this is, I think in the U.S., we have it exactly backward. I, when a person gets married, and they're uh, making the commitment to another human being, the commitment that you make is not, I will be with them as long as I'm happy, or I will be with them until something better comes along. You are saying that you promise to spend the rest of your life learning about that person and loving them. It's about what you are promising to them, not what they're going to give you. And in the U.S., that's the attitude we take. What are they going to give me? We do that same exact attitude with the physical, the exterior. The, you know, many times people are, like, fixated on what does my spouse give me? Uh, they don't kiss me enough. They don't give me enough sex. I'm not attracted to them. And it, it doesn't even, like, cross people's mind, like, to look at it. The, the commitment is actually the exact opposite way. Are you touching them in a way that's, what, are you meeting that need for your spouse? Um, if your spouse has a differing drive than you. And I, I don't care if you're the low one or you're the high one. If your spouse's drive is different, are you meeting their need? Not how are they doing for you. Are you meeting their need? And then lastly, what if your spouse is somebody who is very visual and needs to be attracted to you? Are you meeting that need? Are you, you know, um, fulfilling that need. So we'll be discussing each one of those, but I wanted to point out, I think here in the United States especially, we have it exactly backwards, and I think uh, the, the biblical model is for you to be meeting their need and serving them, not the other way around. Okay, so now we've said that part, um, let's start with the non-sexual touching, okay? To, this is really fairly easy. What we want to do is um, to touch your spouse in a way that they enjoy and on, on a regular basis. Now, some people just like to, you know, put your hand on my shoulder, rub my arm, uh, put your arm around my waist, stuff like that, okay? that That is the way that they like to be touched. So, maybe a massage. So, ask your spouse, what type of ways do they like to be touched? And then do that on a regular basis. Now, um, usually people think something like this. I want to do it spontaneously because I feel like it. Well, if you're maybe not feeling it this moment, your spouse still needs it. So maybe if you could just train yourself to say, I will one time a day at least touch them in a, in a longer way, like um, not the quick little touchy stuff, but I'm going to actually take a moment and hug them and do it for an extended period. You know what I'm saying? So start training yourself to do that on a regular basis. 
Uh, another non-sexual uh, physical thing is, is uh, hugging and kissing. Now, I know that hugging and kissing can both lead to sex sometimes, but what happens is um, you have a one spouse who is high drive and the one spouse who is lower drive, and every time they are hugged or kissed, it it's like, is it going to lead to sex? Is it going to lead to sex? And it, it, it's a turn off. So what you want to do is sometimes kiss, not the little goodbye peck, right, but actually kiss your spouse like you love them. And don't necessarily, you know, don't say, yeah, I'm hoping it leads to sex. Of course, part of you may be thinking that, but sometimes kiss them just because you kiss them. Okay, same for hugging. Hugging, cuddling, <coughs> holding them close. Sometimes do that on a regular way, in a way that they enjoy, and and have no other demand other than I I felt like having your body close to mine and it feels great. Thank you. Do you know what I mean? Um, when you are doing it in a way that you are meeting their need rather than hoping that they will meet yours, it frees the other guy up to feel like, oh, I kind of want to meet that need now. So, non-sexual physical connection is very important. Uh, dear hubby and I, we really like to hold hands a lot. <laughs> we hold hands all the time. When we're in the car, we put our hands on, our, on each other's knee. You know, um, I lean my head on his shoulder a lot. He puts his hand around my shoulder or my waist a lot. Do those kind of things. People need to be touched. Okay? So we got that portion. Um, for um, sex. In Christian circles, it has been my experience that, um, again, in the U.S., we are completely fixated on sex. And so there are a lot of blogs out there that are, you know, how to have Christian sex. Great Christian sex. Hot, holy, humorous, right? I love the hot, holy, humorous people. Um, and then a couple of other people that I really, really love, the, the generous wife and the generous husband, they have really good advice. It's biblical, and it's clear. They don't mince words. And I love that. I love that. Um, so I don't need to go into that here. But what I do need to go into is a couple of things as relates to affairs. Nine times out of ten, not always, but really, really often, affairs are not about sex, although that is the stereotype that's out there. Um, usually, affairs are about um, having enough extinguishers going without enough kindlers, and then here comes somebody else who will put on the kindlers and they get distracted by that. And even amongst men um, who may have a, a tendency sort of to, to be more visual and easily excitable and, and enticed into sex, even then, she usually, the other woman will usually flatter him a whole bunch first, kind of compliment him, admire him, stuff like that, where it, that's needs, and then that's stuff that he's sort of so, sopping it up. So the first quick thing is, rarely is an affair about sex. Usually it's about different uh, the different kinds of needs that people have, and uh, the, the balance of the extinguishers and the, and the kindlers being off whack, okay? But in this instance, we're talking about physical commitment, and specifically the Christian idea of physical commitment. Okay, as uh, young teenager people, we have crazy raging hormones. This is how God designed us. Okay, this is because as as teenagers, you know, we're looking to look for our mates, and um, God designed us so that uh, physical intimacy is pleasurable. This is the way that he made it, okay? Um, in Song of Solomon, that whole book is poetry, but it is erotic. And there are activities in there that are uh, deeply physically sexual. <laughs> so my encouragement to you would be to look at the Bible and look at God's design on sexuality. Make your mind in line with God's mind as regards sex. And that is, 
in a married, committed relationship, he wants us to be intimate with each other. And intimacy does not just mean in the body. But what happens is that sometimes, uh, you know, women will think, well, I uh, connect with him physically, uh, you know, um, intellectually or emotionally, but oh, it, physically it's just another chore. That is not in line with God's idea of sex. So get in, study the Bible regarding sex. There's verses that tell us, do not separate yourself from your spouse, except for, you know, instances that are, this is this designated period for prayer, okay? Otherwise, you're not supposed to be apart from your spouse physically. Um, that is God's way of thinking about it. Also, you know, Adam knew Eve, well, that's not just about sex, but it is part of it. He took the time to really get to know her emotionally, spiritually, and yes, physically. And that's, she conceived a son. So, as regards to sex, our job is not, hey, me, 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 give me an orgasm. When am I going to get some sex? Hello, hello, you know, like that. But more like, what does my spouse need? What um, <coughs> turns my spouse on? What um, can we do as a couple that is mutually enjoyable? Okay. Now, sometimes you will have one of the two that's a little more reserved or lower drive, and one of the two that's a little more expressive or a little higher drive. And what you want to do is think, if, if the one who's lower is thinking, what does my spouse need, they would realize they need that physical release and connection. The one who's a little higher drive, if they're thinking, what does my spouse need, they might think, my spouse needs to feel connected and to sometimes be able to rest. That maybe their body is just the kind that needs some rest sometimes. So they would both be working to meet the other guy, and thus they could reach a conclusion that's mutually enjoyable. Uh, maybe the lower guy kicks it up a little bit of a notch, and the higher guy kicks it down a little bit of a notch. But a bang, you know, there you go, you found your happy medium. So get, get your mind wrapped around God's idea of sexuality. Um, get your mind wrapped around the idea that you are, it is important in your marriage to meet your spouse's sexual needs. No, I'm not saying you have to do stuff that you don't like, that you, that hurts any of that. But speak to your spouse, be open, be sharing, and say, I'm a little uncomfortable with this, I would be willing to talk about it and see where it goes because you're on the same team. And then bear in mind that your job is to meet their needs, and their job is to meet your needs. And coming at it from that kind of an angle. The final part to talk about today is being physically attractive. Now, this one is a really touchy um, topic because so many, you know, the, 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 the standard op argument, the guys say, oh, she only married me for my wallet. And the ladies say, oh, he only married me for my body. Well, guess what? I'm going to tell you, the fact is, maybe. You know, guys love their wives' bodies, and there's nothing wrong with that. But one thing I did learn, and it took me probably till I was like into my 30s and 40s to figure this out, I myself, um, in case you can't tell, uh, I'm a shorter person, and I am uh, built... Um, I call it like I'm really firm. I'm, you know, I'm uh, stocky, right? I'm not a skinny little bean of a person. And for years, I did not like myself or my body or the way I looked or anything. And then I realized God created me. He was distinctly involved in every aspect of me. My hair, my eyes, my teeth, uh, you know, how chunky I am, everything, my short little legs, everything. And there are aspects of me that um, are very appealing to some people. When you and your husband met, or like if you're a fella and you feel like physically unattractive, when you and your wife met, there were parts of you that attracted them. 
they uh, found maybe your eyes attractive, your hair, something, okay, whatever it would be. And I'm here to encourage you that when you think of your body, instead of thinking, oh, I'll do this or that when I lose 10 pounds. No, you are beautiful the way you are. So don't just, you know, critique your body. It, everybody has scars. Everybody has a bigger butt than they want or a, a bigger tummy or something, all right? But we also all have attributes that are positive. And the physical attractiveness thing is that um, when you get married, you are attracted to the person initially. And we don't, you know, we have children, life goes on, guys start to bald, whatever it may be, we physically do change. But what happens often in a marriage is the, the children come, wife gains some pounds. Uh, taking care of children is hard work 24 hours a day, so she's wearing sweats and a t-shirt and doesn't get dressed up anymore. Or likewise the guy. He sits on the couch in his jeans and t-shirt and watches the football game and burps. You know, doesn't look, take the time to look good anymore. <coughs> and so here's what I'm, uh, the physical commitment, meeting your spouse's needs to be attractive. I'm not saying you have to be a certain weight. I'm not saying you have to be a certain anything, really. But what you do need to do is make the effort to look good and smell good. Make the effort to comb your hair and put it up a little bit. Um, if you're the guy, you know, make your hair look nice. Um, make the effort to brush your teeth, go in the shower, use some scented soap. Do you know what I mean? Wear clean clothes. Wear clothing that um, accentuates the positive. It's, it looks good. You know, it's a good color. See this color? This looks kind of good on me because I'm a natural brunette with brown eyes. So I have, I look good in natural colors. This is what I need. I'm not saying go ahead and look, but if you will make some effort, and, and I understand some days you have to wear the sweats because you're going to work out or something, right? But if you wear uh, clothing that fits you cute, and then on the occasion, throw on that slinky back black dress, I can't tell you how much that will mean to your marriage. Likewise, fellas, you know, if you are a, a guy and you're working in the garage and, you know, your fingernails are dirty and stuff, that's cool, you know, you're working for your family. No stress. But come home, clean up a little bit, put on that shirt, you know, and the, the those tight-fitting jeans that she used to like. And, uh, yeah, th this will make a big difference for your marriage. Now, not everyone has the need for physical attraction as much. Some of these needs, you know, they vary. Obviously, there's the person who has high sex drive, the person who has low sex drive. There's the person who likes to be touched a lot, the person who likes to be, I don't like that as well. Same for physical attraction. Some people really need to be physically attracted to their spouse. Some people not as much. And so what you need to do is talk to your spouse about it. Don't be ashamed to say, this is kind of something that means I love you to me. I will give you my example. I do not really like to be touched in my past I was um, abused and, and physically abused as a child where my parents would hit me and so uh, sometimes being touched scares me so my ex or my uh, dear hubby he has learned to sort of let me know first and then he'll touch me but him he loves to be touched I don't think he can be touched enough <laughs> but that's okay because we have talked about it and so I know I'm free to pretty much have my hands on him anytime he loves it he soaks that in same for, you know, with set, we talk about when do we want it, how much, time of day, who does what to whom, how often, because I want to know what he needs and like, you know, and vice versa. Same thing for physically attractive. I think um, I let him know the things that attract me about uh, me to him or the things I find attractive about him. Um, and likewise, you know, he lets me know Oh, you know, he heals my smile, for example, and right? he tells me. But um, we also have told each other how much do we need this attraction to physical, you know, is that really important to us, is or not? Maybe it's just not. That's okay. Just talk to your spouse about it, and then hit some, meet the commitment of meeting your spouse's need, 
not not yours, your spouse's. Find out about them, learn about them, and then meet that commitment. Or be committed to meeting that need, and that would be the physical commitment need. So, here we are. We've discussed sex. We've discussed touching. We've discussed being physically attractive, and I would venture to guess that you have a comment about it. Maybe you agree with me completely, and yay, thank you so much. Maybe you utterly disagree. I would love to hear about it and discuss it with you. So please put any comments on the, the YouTube channel if you're watching there, or on the blog, make a comment, and um, I will do my best to, uh, you know, have a little dialogue with you. I would love to know. Now, tomorrow, uh, we'll be discussing uh, Love Kids Learn number four, which is financial commitment. This is meeting your spouse's monetary needs. You know, we talked today about how, oh, he only married me because of my body. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about, oh, she only married me because of my wallet. <laughs> so, okay, uh, thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you back tomorrow, and hope you have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.